Welcome to part two of the Carver TFM45 repair. If you haven't seen part one yet, I'd recommend you watch that first so you can see what kind of work I've done so far. The first thing I'm gonna do is replace the op amp U1. That's this silver coated chip right here. It's a Texas Instruments TL081CP op amp. And although I believe the only bad op amp is on this, the right channel. I'm going to replace the one on the left channel as well. The direct replacements are still available from DigiKey and likely other suppliers. And they're very, very cheap, so I ordered many, so it's not a big deal to just replace both of them. So let's get started with that. All right, U1 on both amp modules has been replaced. No surprises at all while doing this, pretty straightforward. I think they turned out well, and they should work really well. Nothing obviously wrong with either of the old ones. Not that I would think there would be anything obviously wrong physically anyway. <clears throat> so let's look at the power supply board. This thing is a mess. So there's not that many caps on here. Obviously, we have the big smoothing caps over here on the right, but the rest are just some smaller caps. Kind of odd. So especially if you look at these three, you can see the variety in, in color, which is probably different manufacturers. And these look clean, so they look like they're factory. So that, and they look like they came like that from the factory. Kind of interesting. There's definitely been some work done on this post manufacturer, original manufacturer. So if you look at these pins right here, quite a bit longer than all the other pins. Those are these two caps. Those have probably been replaced at some point. If you look here, there's been some work done here. This component was either replaced or the solder was redone. This is a uh, transistor, probably a regulator transistor. And there's a lot of other spots on the board that look pretty nasty. I'll get all that cleaned up when I recap it though. This is interesting, so I saw this when I was doing initial troubleshooting. Um, I am not sure what this is. I tried to find this on the schematic, but the schematic is so unreadable I can't find any of the uh, neighboring components, and I, haven't, I didn't really look that hard. I don't know exactly what this is for, but I'm confident that it is intentional because uh, not only is there glue holding the two wires down to the board, but also the markings on the board show that there should be two floating wires there. So I'm sure there's one or many people out there who know what these are for, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with how these are mounted or soldered. I think they're just fine and I think they're intentional, so I'm not going to touch them and I'm not going to look into it any further. But if any of you know what these are for in general, please put it in the comments and uh, so I can learn something and maybe some other people could learn something too. The only other thing I noticed is that this cap looks to be pretty badly bulged. Now, I've seen this before on some caps, even new caps. It's just like an air pocket in there between the capacitor and like the, the external film or whatever. But usually you can push that down. This is solid, so I think this is actually starting to bulge. So I'm surprised we don't have uh, any issues with the power supply really at all. Maybe this is going to go any day and, and we will have a massive issue. So it'll be good to get them replaced. I have all of the replacement caps here, smaller ones and the bigger ones, of course. The two big ones here, these are 2200 at 80. I have 2200 at 100. They're about the same size. They're the same length. The diameters are a little bit smaller on the new ones, which is good. The smaller ones, however, 3300 at 35. These are direct replacements, 3300 at 35. They're a lot shorter, or a bit shorter, and the diameter is much smaller. It's interesting to me how some caps, the direct replacements are much smaller while the others are almost the same size. Anyway, I'm going to get this recapped, I'll get the back of the board cleaned up, and I'll be back. The power supply board has been completely recapped, and I think it turned out really well. I was able to clean the back of the board pretty well. Usually I just use Q-tips and isopropyl alcohol. Pretty much everything came up um, as expected, however I did run into one issue. So while I was cleaning this contact here, Hopefully you can already see it. This trace lifted. So it didn't lift by this much that you can see right here. It only lifted right in the middle by, I don't know, maybe one or two millimeters. 
However, it was starting to peel back, and I didn't want it to short against any of the contacts, so I took an X-Acto knife, and I uh, cut it here and here, and just removed the trace. And so now it's a nice, clean break, and now I'll just uh, use a wire, a separate wire, and make a bridge from here to here. Should work just fine. That was the only problem, really, that I came across while recapping this. So I'm going to make that bridge with that wire. I'll get this power supply board reinstalled in the amp. I'll get the uh, amplifier modules reinstalled as well. And we'll see if I made any major mistakes. OK, everything is back together. And uh, the unit powers on. It works just as it did before. Unfortunately, the right channel still has a lower output than the left channel, as you can see on the scope here. So what you're seeing is a 2 kilohertz sine wave. The right channel is on top, and the left channel is on the bottom. And as you can see, the right channel is about uh, half of the left channel. What's good is the uh, waveforms look nice, both nice clean sine waves. Uh, it's just the amplitude that's a major problem. So I looked at the schematic a little bit closer, and I noticed that while U1, one of the inputs to U1 is the signal, the other input comes from U2. U2 is another op amp down here. And uh, that led me to wonder if U2 might be a problem or something associated with the U2 circuitry. And then I noticed RP2, which is a potentiometer. And uh, I looked in the service manual, and there is an adjustment procedure using RP2. And what I found there is that the adjustment procedure for RP2, it's, it's called the damping uh, adjustment and so basically you can think of it as attenuation. Uh, U2 measures the current at the output of each channel across this resistor at the end here R97 and it takes that uh, current reading and it dampens it accordingly based on the frequency of the output. And so I inserted this 2 kilohertz sine wave as uh, in the adjustment procedure calls for and I adjusted the RP2 just a little bit and it absolutely adjusts the output significantly. And so the interesting thing about this is the right channel is lower than the left channel but the right channel according to the adjustment procedure is actually closer to the target output. So with a 2 kilohertz uh, 35 millivolt input we should have about one volt peak to peak on the output. So the right channel is actually closer to where I want to be. And it's still a little bit high, but I'm going to adjust that down. And I actually want to adjust the left channel down. So I was thinking that the right channel was too low compared to the left channel, but actually the, the left channel is just too high. And the right channel is a little bit high as well. And so I'm going to adjust the pots right now, RP2, on both channels. I'll start with the right channel just to bring that down to where it should be, one volt. And I'm going to be very careful. I still don't have a plastic headed tweaker or flat headed screwdriver. So I'm using the metal one and it's very close to the, the board. So you can see there I'm, I'm rotating the RP2 clockwise ever so gently. And uh, I'm below the uh, oscilloscope right now, so it's hard to tell if I'm wearing where I need to be, but I, I know I'm getting close. So that's pretty close for the right channel. And now I'll adjust the left channel down to where it should be also about one volt peak to peak. And actually the easiest way to do that, I want the outputs to be identical. So I'll just overlay them and adjust the left channels down until they're completely matching. overcompensated there. Let's see if I can go back. There we go. That looks great. It looks like one waveform when they're overlaid. So there we go. That's about one volt peak to peak. Good enough for me. I'm loving the way that looks now. Here's the board that sends the signals from each channel to its respective meter as well as controls the intensity to the bulbs. As you can see, I've already recapped this. There's not much to show on this board, so let's move on. 
Okay, it's time to upgrade these lamps for some LEDs. So I have blue LEDs here per customer request. They're fairly standard, however they do have a higher output than standard LEDs, so they should work really well. Based on the maximum voltage across the circuit, as well as the voltage drop of each LED, as well as the desired current of 20 milliamps through the circuit, I'm using a 715 ohm at 0.6 watt resistor as the current limiting resistor. So the only thing I haven't figured out yet is how to mount these. So I could just remove the old lamps and install the new LEDs and mount them as is. However, they do have these metal clamps. I'm a little worried that they're gonna be, could get too close to the leads and potentially short out one or both of the LEDs. So I'm gonna have to figure that out, but I will get them installed and we'll be back to test. All right, here's the final product. It's not the prettiest, but I'm fairly confident that it's gonna work. There were a few important factors with this. Number one is the distance between the LEDs and the board, and the distance between the LEDs and the bottom of the board as well. They have to be very similar to what the lamps were, just to ensure that they clear both the meters as well as the front faceplate. And so they're very, very close to what the lamps were. I've already put this in place to make sure that it's gonna fit and it's not gonna go anywhere. I was also originally concerned that there was gonna be too much play in the LEDs and their leads and that maybe they would flop around a little bit and could potentially break, but these are very solid. I, I uh, trimmed them down as short as I could while still being able to maintain the bend that they have. So I think they're gonna be rigid and they're gonna be uh, very well set in place. So you have the uh, current limiting resistor here. You can see I used one of the pads from this clamp or bracket here. So I remove both brackets obviously and I use one of these pads and just put it in series with, uh, this must be the positive rail here. So I <clears throat> was able to work that out pretty well so it still looked pretty nice from the front and I uh, wouldn't struck, obstruct anything from the front or the back since I bent the resistor down. So this is all done now too. I'm gonna install it back in the front face plate. We'll get the front face plate reinstalled and uh, test these out. Everything is back together now. Let's take a look at how the LEDs turned out. So I think they look really good. They do appear quite a bit brighter in the camera than they do in real life. They look about as close to perfect as you can get in real life. So I'm really happy with the results on that. I did plan on replacing the speaker binding posts in this video as well, but due to time constraints, I won't be able to do that. So let's move on to the final sound test. Sounds really good. Both left and right channels meters, uh, the needles move in unison after that adjustment. And uh, everything is running really well. So I'm very happy with this. I'm gonna call this one done. As always, I appreciate you watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you next time.